Welcome again to the Apache Junction Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're glad that you have chosen to join us as a part of this worship service as we go through this challenging time. But we are glad that, again, we have many blessings to be thankful for, and we can still meet together, even though it's not the ideal way we can come together through technology and worship and praise the Lord together. I would just mention, first of all, if you have prayer or praise requests that you want to share with the church family, you can contact Ro. Her information should be there on the screen if you don't have that. If something comes up during the week that you would like the church family to remember in prayer, you can also let her know and she will send that out. And if you would like to be a part of our prayer ministries team, again, contact her. She will be happy to add you to the list, but we appreciate all of our prayer warriors and what they are willing to do to uplift our needs, our concerns to God continually in prayer. Would also again remind you of our Zoom Sabbath School class. There is an invite that goes out through email or through text, which gives you the link, or you can go straight to the website and get it. If you want to get those emails and you're not, you can either give us your email address or your cell phone number, and we can add that to the list so that you can get that. Um, just send that to ajadventist at gmail.com. Also, again, would remind you we are doing a small in-person Sabbath school, which you need to register for. Um, you can contact the pastor and let him know you would like to be a part of that. You can register again starting Monday morning and let us know if you want to be a part of that. We are limiting it, and there are some requirements. Those are on the web page, um, the church website on the web page. You can look at that and you can see those. But if you would like to be a part of that, that's also from 9.30 to 10.30 in the morning in the social hall. Also, again, we're doing our prayer meeting, Zoom prayer meeting service. We just started last Wednesday night with the last chapters of the Great Controversy. This Wednesday, we'll be studying chapter 30, Enmity Between Man and Satan. There is also a study guide that is available on the website. You can use that to go along, but we would encourage you to join us to be a part of our Zoom prayer meeting service um, each and every Wednesday night. At this time, we'll go ahead and have our opening song, Take the Name of Jesus with you. If you would like to stand and sing, if you want to just sit and sing, but we hope you'll join in and sing with us as we sing Take the Name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you, take it then where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name. a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven at the name of Jesus bowing falling prostrate at his feet King of kings in heaven will crown him when our journey is complete precious name oh how sweet hope of earth and joy name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. 
Again, want to remind you of our church website. Some resources available there at apachejunction.adventistfaith.org. Also, the weekly email. If you're not getting it and you would like to have that information, it is there. The message from Pastor Van. Also, some of the different church resources. Links are available there. And for our online giving, if you would like to participate through the website, through online giving, their instructions and the ability to do that there at the church website. Would also remind you our offering this Sabbath is for local church budget. If we were in the church, that would be where the offering would go. Again, you know, want to remind you of all the many different needs of our local church, of our conference church family, of our world church family on every level. Uh, but appreciate you continuing to support our local church needs. I would remind you again, our Adobe Adventist Christian School has started. Um, of course, you can support that year-round, but especially now, remind you of the Arizona tax credit that is available, that you have a choice of sending your money to the state or designating it to go to one of our Adventist schools. And, of course, we recommend Adobe Adventist Christian School. There's the Fry's VIP reward system where you can link your card and a percentage of whatever you spend at Fry's goes to the school. There's the Amazon Smile program. If you order things through Amazon, you can link that where that also helps support our school. But again, we just appreciate your support for our many church needs, for your continued support of our church through your tithes and your offerings. would also just mention, if you want to mail that in, you can send it to P.O. Box 3250, Apache Junction, 85117, or you can go to the church website and do it through Adventist Giving, and those instructions are available there on the website also. At this time, we'd invite you, if you have some of your children, or you just feel young at heart, and maybe, you know, you feel brave and nobody's watching or whatever, or regardless of who's watching, if you want to join um, the Cox sisters as they lead out in a song for our children, we would invite you to do that at this time. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. Um, we also have special music, which will be by Ivan Morford. Wonderful words of life.
you, Ivan. Appreciate that special music and the beautiful words of that song. Um, at this time, we would invite you to bow your heads or if you would like to kneel with me as we open our worship service with prayer. Our gracious, loving Father, again, we are thankful for the privilege we have to come together. And even though it is not the way we would prefer we are thankful that we can still come together to praise, to worship, to honor, to uplift the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that in this service, that in our lives, in everything that we do, we would have but one desire, and that is to uplift Jesus, to reflect him, to share him, to be filled with his spirit, to be filled with his presence. Father, we would ask that you would be with the many needs of our congregation, with each home, each family, each relationship, that you would guide, you would lead, that you would be with the needs of our country, the struggles, the challenges that are going on, that in spite of all that's going on, that you would lead, that you would use things in a way that is redemptive, in a way that would draw hearts to you. And Father, as we take a moment to open the words of life, we ask for your spirit to open our hearts, our minds, our understanding, Help us that we would be open to your spirit, that we would be filled, that we would be changed by your spirit, by your grace, by your word, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You've all heard the little saying, sticks and stones, you know what comes next, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words will never hurt me. Anybody believe it? You know, I'm sure you're probably not raising your hand in your house, but nonetheless, is it true? No truth to it whatsoever, is there? The truth is, words can hurt very deeply. Words can also be healing, though at the same time, they can have both effects. There can be words that are said that leave scars from childhood all the way to the grave. Pain and heartache from something maybe a parent said, a friend said, a child said, whoever, somebody said something that it stuck and it left a scar that never quite seems to heal. And yet there can also be those words that make a difference. Maybe you don't think much of it. Again, I believe I've shared a little bit about it, but back when I started in between my junior, after the summer of my junior year, started my flying to get my flight instructors. Happened to be up there with a friend, going around, showing him the walk around the plane, and the instructor just made the comment, you know, why don't you get your flight instructors and help me teach next year? I'm guessing he probably didn't think there was any chance that I would actually decide, yeah, that's a good idea, I'm going to do that. It made a difference. We never know what our words will do, and we need to think and we need to use them carefully to make sure that our words are words that are healing, that are helpful, and not words that hurt and are harmful. It is interesting, of course, in, you know, the... I guess, you know, Google and the Internet Encyclopedia, Wikipedia, it talks a little bit about it. And it talks about it was an English language children's rhyme and it was used to defense against name calling, calling and verbal bullying. It was intended to increase resiliency, avoid physical retaliation, and to remain calm in that situation. Now, of course, there are some variations of it that I found online that I thought were kind of interesting. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never break me. It sounds good theoretically, but the truth is, that's not true either. Many people are broken by words that things say. We see it in social media today. Everybody can say almost anything behind the cloak of anonymity, of not being seen, of not being heard. And there are people, because of what's been said on social media, what's been said about them, that have gone to the extreme of committing suicide because of it. A different one. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me. Again, 
It would be nice if it was true, and I guess theoretically it shouldn't. shouldn't matter to any of us what somebody calls us, but the reality is it does. In the movie it mentioned, I haven't seen it, but in 2004's Divine Comedy, there I guess was a song that part of the words were this, Sticks and stones may break my body, but words can tear me apart. Sadly, there is a lot of truth to that simple statement. The pain, the heartache that comes from words that are said carelessly, maybe intentionally with a purpose to hurt, to harm, to wound, to intimidate, all sorts of reasons that we use words that are not healthy. Do names matter? You know, you may have heard some about a particular football team with a name that has been controversial, and because of some pressure, they finally decided to change it. But I went online, you know, why is that word so offensive? Here's one of the things I found on Wikipedia. You can find other things. The term redskin was in fact used in conjunction with scalp hunting in the 19th century. In 1863, a Winona, Minnesota newspaper, the Daily Republican, printed an announcement The state reward for dead Indians has been increased to $200 for every redskin sent to purgatory. $200 in 1963, I should have done the math, but I can only imagine how much that would be today. The sum is more than the dead bodies of all the Indians east of the Red River are worth. A news story published in the Atkinson Daily Champion in Atkinson, Kansas on October 9, 1885 tells of the settlers' hunt for redskins with a view of obtaining their scalps worth 250. In his early career as the owner of the newspaper in South Dakota, L. Frank Baum wrote an editorial upon the death of Chief Sitting Bull in which he advocates the annihilation of all remaining redskins in order to secure the safety of white settlers, because better they die than live the miserable wretches that they are. You know, it's not hard for me to understand why that name would be offensive. You know, ask the Washington football team as they've changed their name, but only because of political pressure, because people that had money said they were going to withdraw from the team. Now, maybe you say, well, you know, it's about being politically correct, and I'm not worried about being politically correct. Well, maybe a better question is, is it important that we're sensitive or insensitive in our words and our comments? Is it important that we're kind or unkind? Does it make a difference? But if we really want to be honest, what it really comes down to is, are we Christ-like or are we unchrist-like in the way we treat others, in the way we talk about others, in the way we use names, in the way we use words? You see, the truth is, the names we use, the words we use, reflect our attitude towards others. Now, maybe it's just carelessness. Maybe it's just insensitivity. Maybe we're not prejudiced or biased. We just don't take the time to understand why this is offensive or why this hurts. But you know, the truth is, folks, should somebody have to tell me the reason it hurts for me to believe it hurts? There's a lot of names that we use. You know, in my home, me amor or amor, my love, love, used frequently to talk to each other, sweetheart, a word that we use. You know, there are a lot of different names, some of them that we like, some that maybe we don't like. You know, I remember, and I'm not going to tell you what it was, but when I was a little child, my mother had a name that she used to call me. It didn't bother me when I was a little kid. When I got older and she kept using it, it just didn't feel right. It just didn't feel comfortable. It wasn't anything derogatory. It wasn't anything horrible or anything like that. I just didn't care for it. And I remember telling her one day, said, Mom, you know, I'd really prefer that you didn't use that name, that you didn't call me that. You know, it's interesting. I don't remember my mother discussing, you know, whether or not I had the right to make that decision or to ask her to do that. I don't remember a discussion about what her motives were or anything else. Simply the fact that I asked her not to call me that was enough. I don't ever remember her calling me that again. You know, that ought to be enough if we care about people. The fact that it makes them uncomfortable, that they don't like it, that ought to be reason enough, shouldn't it? And yet so often it's not. Proverbs 
a little different, but Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, you've heard it before. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. In the New International Version, just a little different. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. How much do you value your name? How important is it to you? Names are important. You remember in the story of Jacob, the name that he was given, the meaning of it, it represents something. One who follows on another heels, supplanter. And sadly, this was the history of Jacob for way too long. It was Jacob who decided with his mom that, you know, we need to take things in our own hands. Your dad is going to bless Esau, and he's not supposed to do that. We need to intervene. We need to intercede. The pain and the heartache that came from that. It is many years down the road. Many pains, many sorrows later. But you remember as Jacob is returning home, he has the night of wrestling with the angel, wrestling with God as Esau is coming to meet him. Genesis 32 verse 28 puts it this way, And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have what? For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Now you know, I can't go back and ask, but I've got a good suspicion that I know which name Jacob preferred. That he would much prefer to be called Israel than Jacob. To be called the one who struggled with God and man and prevailed versus the one who is on another's heel, who is a supplanter. It's interesting. Maybe you remember in the story of the four Hebrews of Daniel and his three friends, their names, the Hebrew names had meaning. They represented the character at least that was hoped for the child to have. Daniel's name meant very simply, God is my judge. I wonder how often we have forgot God is my judge. He's your judge. He is the judge. Now Jesus says all judgment has been committed to him, but I don't find any judgment that's committed to me. Not my job to judge you. It's not your job to judge me. Certainly we have to make decisions in our lives. We have to make decisions what we believe God's Word means, but ultimately it is God who sees and judges the heart. Hananiah, Yahweh is gracious. I wonder how many times we forget the graciousness of God, the patience, the long-suffering, how gracious God has been to you and to me, to us each and every day. Michelle, Who belongs to God? A simple question. You know, a question that we need to be reminded of. A question that goes along with our sermon, with the whole concept of Scripture. Do you belong to God or not? Or are you willing to acknowledge that you belong to Him? And Azariah, Yahweh helps. Something that we need need to remember. It is interesting A little bit later in Daniel chapter 4, when Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, this dream he remembers, and he calls the wise men and astrologers, and once again, they cannot interpret it. They cannot give him the meaning. And so he calls Daniel, and it's interesting what he says, but at last Daniel came before me, his name Belteshazzar, according to the name of what? My God, of course, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all names representing the pagan gods of Babylon. Ultimately, my friends, my name represents either the God of heaven or the gods of this world. But at last Daniel came before me, his name Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him the spirit of what? It's the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, and he goes into the dream. But in him is the Spirit of the Holy God, my friends, is God's Spirit in you and in me. Because there's only two spirits. If it's not God's Spirit, it's another spirit, and I don't want that spirit in me. Our scripture that we've been looking at, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, If my people who are called by my name will what? will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven 
and forgive their sin and heal their land. Called by my name. What does it mean to be called by my name? Well, I suppose I could use it literally. You know, to be called by the name Bledsoe, it means something. Probably not near as much to most people as maybe it does to me, depending on how you use it. Now, there's a few people, you know, that have asked me if I'm related to Drew. Used to play quarterback for the New England Patriots, played for the Dallas Cowboys. Was nice when he played there. It made it very easy to get nice personalized jerseys that already had my name on it. But again, ultimately, our names are not really what matters in that sense. It is that we are called by God's name. It is about a relationship, about a relationship that we have. It is about identity. Do we realize who we are, that we were created in the image of God? That God is in the process of trying to restore that image in us if we will cooperate? He wants to have a personal relationship with you and with me. He wants us to know that our identity is not that we came from some monkey, from some evolutionary idea, but that we were created in His image. He made us, and He will restore us if we will allow Him. Some of the different names, and we don't have time to look at all of them, but the different names in Scripture that represent who God is. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26 and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments, and keep His statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am what? I am the Lord who heals you. My friends, there is only one person who can truly bring healing physically, emotionally, spiritually into this world, and that is God. He is the one. It is the Lord who heals Exodus chapter 31 verse 13 speaks also to the children of Israel saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign, what? Between you and me throughout, what? Your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who does what? Who sanctifies you. My friends, there is only one person who can make you holy, who can sanctify you, who can truly change you in a healthy, positive way, and that is God. It is the Lord who sanctifies you who makes you different. The psalm, the 23rd psalm, the very first verse, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, you know, I don't know much Spanish, and I'll probably do this disservice in trying to read it. But, you know, for some obvious reasons, there's something about this verse in Spanish that just appeals to me. Jehovah es mi pastor, nada mi faltera. The Lord is my pastor. That is the concept of shepherd. You know, folks, I don't know what you're going through, and maybe the pastor has let you down, be it this one or some other one, but there is one that will never let you down. Jesus puts it this way, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the one that watches over us, that will always be with us. The story of Genesis of Abraham that we looked at. And Abraham called the place, what? The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The Lord is the one who provides for all of our needs according to His riches in Jesus. Judges 6, the story of Gideon. Chapter 6, verses 23 and 24. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not what? Fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it what? The Lord is peace. To this day, it is still an offer of the Abizites. Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 21, the story of the birth of Jesus. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name what? Jesus, for he will do what? He will save His people from their sins. My friends, the Bible is very clear. There is only one name given among men in heaven and earth anywhere that can save us, and that is the name of Jesus. There is no hope anywhere else. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way apart from Jesus. There is no truth apart from Jesus. And there is no life apart from Jesus. 
If you're apart from Jesus, I invite you to return to Him. He will restore your broken relationship. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. My friends, from the moment Adam and Eve sinned and broke that relationship, the longing of God's heart has always been to be with His children. To be with us back in the early history of the Israelites. You remember when they built that sanctuary, God said, Let them build me a sanctuary that what? That I may dwell among them. God wants to be with you each and every moment, each and every day. Will you allow God to come into your life? Will you allow Jesus to fill you with His grace, with His Spirit? Will you allow Him to be with you? Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And we had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was for a whole year that they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were what? First called Christians in Antioch. That name that we still go by today, that name that they got because all they wanted to do was talk about Christ. I wonder... If people were to name us today, would they actually call us Christians? Or would they call us something else? What is it that we really talk about that we focus on? How often it's so many things other than Christ. His love, His grace, His righteousness. Called by my name. We are His representatives in everything we do, or we are to represent Him. We are to reflect His character in our hearts and our lives. In everything we do, the question is, do you reflect Jesus? Do I reflect Jesus? In everything in my life, does it speak to others about Jesus? Are we really Christians? In truth, in reality, or is it just a name? And maybe if we put it a little farther, do we misrepresent His name? You know, the devil's best argument against Christianity, sadly, all too often is Christians. I mean, how sad it is, but how often it's true when people say, well, you know, really, they're not any different than the rest of us. They've got the same problems. They've got the same issues. They don't get along with people. They don't get along with each other. They argue and they fight. They talk about each other behind their back. It would be nice to say that wasn't true, but do we misrepresent His name, misrepresent His character, misrepresent who Jesus really is? A commandment, you may remember it. It's a third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God, what? In vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes His name in vain. Well, pastor, that means we're not supposed to use profanity. Well, certainly that applies, but I think that's just, you know, a cheap excuse so I can do all sorts of things. What does it mean to take God's name in vain? When I as a Christian don't act like Christ, I'm taking His name in vain. When I fail to represent Jesus in my life, in my conversation, in my family, in the way I treat my spouse, in the way I treat my children, in the way I treat my parents, in the way I treat my friends, even in the way I treat my enemies... If I don't do it in a Christ-like way, I'm taking His name in vain. I'm breaking the commandment. You know, we're good at talking about the fourth commandment, and I love it. Don't misunderstand me. I love the Sabbath. It's a beautiful doctrine. But my friends, the Sabbath doesn't mean anything if we're taking the Lord's name in vain each and every day. If we're misrepresenting His character, His grace, in the way we talk and in the way we treat other people. Well, but pastor, you don't understand. They're sinners. Well, yeah, I do understand because that's what all of us are. The Bible says there are none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners in need of a Savior, in need of God's grace, in need of demonstrating His grace in our lives. Called by my name, the God who heals you, the God who sanctifies you, 
The God who is my shepherd, He is the good shepherd, He is the good pastor, He is the one that is there for you anywhere, at any time, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you may feel, believe me, trust God that He is there. The God who said He will never leave you, will never leave you. The God who provides, the God who is peace, the God who saves, the God who is with us. We are called by that name. We are to represent these qualities, these characteristics in our lives, in our relationships. To be a demonstration of God's grace, of His character. And we could look at a lot more names and what they represent. We don't have time. His name. Have you accepted it? You know, I remember early on when Marina was probably about 10 years old. I should have checked. Probably about 16 years ago or so. You know, we went through the process of legally adopting, or I did, legally adopting him where he took my name. Now, he had a choice. Granted, I suppose legally he wouldn't have had a choice. We probably could have forced it on him. He was a minor. But it was his decision. Do you want to have your name legally changed? Do you want to be a Bledsoe? It was his choice. But you know, it was a neat experience that day when the judge took the paperwork, looked over it, and pronounced that his name was changed. Now the truth is, you know, he's become like me in some ways. I'd like to say they're all good, of course, but the truth is you know better. You know, some ways they're better than others. But my friends, ultimately we need to be like Jesus. Because in every way that we're truly like Jesus, it's always good. There are no bad habits that we can pick up from Jesus. There are no negative qualities that Jesus has. And we all have a choice. We have a choice who we will belong to. But the truth is we only have two choices. You see, we can represent the name of Jesus or we can represent the name of Satan. Those are the only two options. Those are the only two choices. Either the truth is I'm becoming more like Jesus or I'm becoming more like Satan. Are you taking time to get to know Jesus and His Word and the Scripture? Have you accepted His name and all that comes with it? One of my favorite Scriptures, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has what? Reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ, who has given us what? The ministry of reconciliation. Everything God has done from the moment Adam and Eve sinned is for the purpose of reconciling you and I to Him, restoring our broken relationship. And God has not only done that, but that is what He has asked us to do, to be ministers of reconciliation, to share His love, to share His grace, to be an instrument of peace, of restoration. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are what? Ambassadors for Christ. You know, I know one of our members here that was, you know, the ambassador to the state of Malta, the country of Malta. But the truth is, and sometimes that sounds kind of impressive to be appointed as an ambassador, but the truth is, folks, each and every one of us who are in Christ are called to be ambassadors for Christ. As through God, we're, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Is there anything in your life that's not right with God? Paul is appealing to you. The Holy Spirit is appealing to you to be reconciled, to make things right with God. There's nothing God wants more than to restore your broken relationship with Him and then to use you in helping others to have a right relationship with Him. In verse 21, For He made Him who what? Who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Him. My friends, there is only one place you will ever find any real righteousness, 
and that is the righteousness of Christ when you accept it by grace through faith. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we who really know no righteousness could become righteous in Him. What an exchange, what a trade, what a deal God made with us. And Galatians, talking about that new creation, about that new relationship, about what the body of Christ should look like, about what our relationship should be with one another. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, For you are all what? Sons of God through what? Through hard work, through keeping the Sabbath, through keeping the commandments, through eating, through... No. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is only one way you will ever be a child of God, and that is by grace through faith. For as many as you are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, I would encourage you to do so. I realize times are a little challenging right now, but if you haven't done it, we can make arrangements to put on Christ. There is neither what? Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all what? One in Christ. My friends, the truth is, if we are not one with each other, it really says something about our relationship with Christ. The problems we have in our church say something about the fact that we are not really in Christ as we ought to be. That we don't have the relationship with Him that we need to have, that we must have, and that God longs to give to us. And if you are Christ, then you are what? You are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do you want to be an heir? An heir according to the promise that God made to Abraham. An heir of all things that has been offered. God's name. Are you taking His name in vain and how you treat others? Have you forgotten that we're all sinners? The truth is we're all racist. You may not be as extreme as somebody else. We all have prejudice. We all have bias. We all struggle with pride, with self-righteousness. We can make a long list because the truth is we're all sinners in need of grace. But my friends, the truth is also there that by God's grace we can be a new creation. We can be a part of the healing of the solution instead of a part of the problem. We can be a part of reconciliation between broken homes, between broken lives, between broken families, between races, between genders, between ethnicities. Whatever it may be, we can be one in Christ because by God's grace we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now the truth is sometimes we're not good brothers and sisters. Sometimes we don't support each other as a family should. But whether that's true or not in your life, the fact is we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And what hurts my brother, the pain my brother feels, should be my pain as well. We are all equal in Christ. That is the beauty of the gospel, the grace of God, the price that God paid for your life and the price He paid for mine. It speaks to my value. It speaks to your value. Jesus paid an incredible price for you and He paid it for me. My friends, He paid it for the white settlers and He paid it for the Native Americans, whether people recognize it or not. He paid it for those that are red or yellow, black and white. Whatever it may be, Jesus paid the same price. And He values each and every one of us the same way, and He asks us to value one another the same. See, really the question is very simple. Are we pre-Pentecost disciples or are we post-Pentecost disciples? Pre-Pentecost disciples are arguing about who's going to be the greatest, about who's going to be in position, about who's going to be in authority, about who's going to be in charge. Post-Pentecost disciples have set aside their differences through prayer. They have come to one accord. They have been filled with the Holy Spirit, and they only have one desire, and that is to tell the world about Jesus. There's a reason they were called Christians, because that's all they wanted to talk about. My friends, are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Are we being led by the Holy Spirit? The truth is we know the answer. If it was yes, we wouldn't be here. Things would be changing Things would be like they were in the early church. The problem is we're not. 
And it starts, it started with them spending time on their knees, spending time in prayer, making things right with one another, setting aside their personal differences, coming together with one desire, and that is to tell the world about Jesus. My friends, if we ever come to that point, or maybe I shouldn't say if, when by the grace of God we finally come to that point, we won't be here very long. Do you believe you've been adopted into the family of God? Do you believe you're a part of His family? Do you want to be a part of that family? I love 1 John chapter 3. Beautiful passage. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be what? Call children of God, therefore the world does not know us, because what? It did not know Him. Beloved, now what? We are children, not we will be, not maybe if we're good enough we can be. We are, why? Because God said so. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be what? We shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. My friends, that is a statement of faith, but by the grace of God, we need to be seeing Him as He is today, more and more and more. And everyone who has what? Has this hope in Him, purifies Himself just as He is pure. My friends, what is the hope you have in your heart? Do you want to be pure just like Jesus is pure? It comes by focusing on Him. Do you want to be like Jesus? Would you like to accept your adoption? Would you like to say, Lord, I want to be a part of your body. I want to be a part of your family. I want to be your child. Would you like to accept Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, as your brother? Maybe more importantly, when you see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory, will you be among those who cry for the rocks and the mountains to hide you from His face? Or will you be among those who say, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for Him, and He will save us. Our gracious Father, truly we do not begin to comprehend the gift we have of being called by Your name, of being Your children, of being Your sons, of being Your daughters of being brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, I would ask in the quiet of this moment, if there is someone who hasn't accepted that relationship, or maybe they accepted it, but they've drifted away. That relationship has become broken, it's become fractured. That in the quiet of this moment, they would say, Lord, I want to be your child again. I want to be reconciled with you. I want to be reconciled with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want the ministry of reconciliation. I want to be used by your Spirit to help others to be reconciled to you. And I want one day to see my Father, to see my brother coming in the clouds of glory to take me to the place he has prepared. Ultimately, I just want to be like Jesus. Father, may this be our prayer each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn, I invite you to sing with me like Jesus. Father and the 
Gracious Father, we would truly ask that you would help us to have but one desire in our heart, and that is to be like Jesus, to become more and more like him each and every day. Father, if there is anyone that hasn't accepted your grace, that hasn't accepted Jesus, again in the quiet of the moment, this moment I would invite them to respond to your spirit, to say, Lord, I know I'm not like you, but by your grace, I want to be like you. I want to be your child. I want to be called by your name. And I want to be ready to meet you when you come. Father, it is our desire that each and every one of us, on that day when you come in the clouds of glory, because we have been called by your name, because we have become like you by your grace, by your spirit, that on that day each and every one of us may say in one voice, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is our hope in Jesus. Amen.